programme. We start tonight with the families who have fled the country rather than face the risk of having their babies taken from them by the courts. We first met new mum Megan Coote last month and on Monday we reported on how she and her mum have flown to Spain to stop her newborn baby Olivia from being taken into care. In a minute, we'll hear from the head of social services in Suffolk. But first, our correspondent Victoria Webb has been to Los Montesinos, the Spanish town where the family have set up home to see how they are coping with their new life. She's the baby at the centre of a row over who should care for her. But Olivia Rose is now more than 900 miles away from the social workers who believe her family may not be up to the job. Are you finding your hands? In this residential street in Los Montesinos, Megan and her mum Lorraine have set up home while the rest of the family is back in Kesgrave. Oh, got a lovely daughter. She's so gorgeous. I, my mum showed me how to bath her once, do the bottles once, and then I'll do it on my own now. Feed her, bath her, dress her. Olivia's father hasn't been in touch since he learnt about the pregnancy. Social services in Suffolk have told the family that they believe Megan's learning difficulties mean she could emotionally neglect her daughter. How does it make you feel when you hear people who say you're not capable of looking after her? That is very, very disgusted, upsetting and that. The thing is, I've got love and support and family back at home, which I'm going to miss. We first met Megan on the 2nd of February. The following weekend, Megan and her mother fled to Spain. And on the 15th, Megan gave birth to Olivia. Megan has done exactly what I knew she would do, and she's been a fantastic mother. Are there moments when you think, I should return to England and face social services? No, never. I do not regret what I have done, because I know I've done the best thing. The unfortunate thing is, is we miss the family so much. Um, that's, that's the hardest. This is the bedroom. This is where Olivia sleeps. This is where I sleep. This is where I change her and bath her. Because yeah. there's actually a bath built into it. Right. And this is her wardrobe. Their case is by no means an isolated one out here. Their neighbours, who are also from Suffolk, had a court order against them concerning a previous child. A few hours after interviewing them, their new baby was taken into care by the Spanish authorities. My partner's still at the hospital breastfeeding, and then I'm picking her up and we're going to register his birth, and then we're going to be in contact with the social workers this afternoon and see where we go from there. These parents in Spain are receiving a lot of support from the campaign group Justice for Families. But the problem is that they, these people are set up to fail, so the assessment units are set up to fail people rather than to keep families together. Lorraine and her husband Dale have offered to help Megan bring up Olivia, but they say they were told by Suffolk Social Services it was likely they wouldn't be deemed as suitable foster parents on account of Dale's aggression. He's not aggressive. No. Um, he's just very frustrated. He gets angry. And a very, a very caring father. Megan and Lorraine have been visited by Spanish authorities after she was reported as a missing vulnerable person. Lorraine says they've been very helpful and they plan to keep in touch with them to prove that Olivia is safe and well. I couldn't split them up. I can't think about it. It would rip my heart out. And I know it would rip Megan's heart out. Although Lorraine's husband Dale owns a business in Suffolk, they believe their only option is for the family to live in Spain permanently to ensure Olivia isn't separated from them. Victoria Webb, Angry News, Los Montesinos in Spain. Well, Suffolk Social Services have come under fierce criticism for the way they've dealt with the two families in Victoria's report. Their local MP, Tim Yeo, and John Hemming, the MP who chairs the Justice for Families campaign group, have been particularly damning. Well, earlier I spoke to the director of Suffolk Social Services, Simon White, and started by asking him how he felt about the MP's claims that his department had been behaving like child snatchers. I find that language uh, deeply unhelpful. Um, what we are concerned with is to protect children from significant harm, and that's what we believe we've done in both of these cases. 
you may feel that the MPs' comments are particularly unhelpful, but it can't be helpful, can it, if families feel forced to actually flee? That doesn't help anyone, does it? Well, um, uh, one of the things that um, I hope people will um, become aware of is that the, uh, the balance of reporting in these cases gives a completely unfair picture about the reality of the work that social services does with families. Um, nearly all of the families that we work with are, uh, cooperate with us um, and are pleased to do so. Um, we're supporting in Suffolk at the moment um, over a thousand uh, families, um, some of, them, of whom we have very, very serious concerns uh, about the safety of their children, but we're supporting them to keep the families intact. Most children who enter the care system go back uh, to their original families. So um, this issue is, is very, very rare, uh, thankfully. So what would you say then to those two MPs, uh, Tim Yeo and also John Hemming? Would you say they're completely wrong? Um, I, I think that they are rowing completely against the stream of the way um, protecting children has, uh, has gone in the last 10 years. Um, there are always people um, who uh, prioritise parents' rights above uh, protecting children. There are always people who feel um, uneasy when the state takes action in people's private lives. Um, but we know that that action is absolutely necessary to protect children. And in these cases, uh, we've followed our policies uh, well, in my opinion, and have been consistent with government guidelines. And briefly, would you say there's an element of trust as well, that you need to win back the trust of certain families? In this case, um, obviously, the, uh, the families are uh, very distrustful of working with us. Um, in the case of um, uh, the second family, there are no care proceedings. So it's very, very early in the process of evaluating what's going to happen to that child and that family. And uh, it's obviously still um, open to them to come back and work with us. And we, we've made contact with the family to make that clear to them. Simon White, thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon. Thank you. And we will, of course, keep you updated on that story as we get it. Next tonight, a nine-year-old girl found strangled by her mother's fiancé should have been safely tucked up in bed, a coroner said today. Stacey Lawrence's body was found in the cab of a lorry parked in a lay-by in Warmington near Arundel last August. She'd been on a delivery run with Darren Walker. His body was found hanging from a nearby tree. Our correspondent Emma Baker was at the inquest. Emma joins us now. Emma. Yes, this afternoon an inquest heard about the final movements of an innocent nine-year-old girl who loved going on lorry trips with her mother's fiancé. They were, for Stacey Lawrence, an adventure. But today the court here in Kettering heard how her final trip went so, so wrong when Darren Walker sexually assaulted her and then killed her. Stacey's mother was in court today. In a statement she said, I cannot believe that morning Darren left as the man I loved and by Saturday he was the man who had caused my daughter's death. I hate him for what he has done to me and my family. Moving words for a woman who will never see her daughter again. It was meant to be a fun trip out with a man she called Dad. Instead, the CCTV pictures were to show Stacey Lawrence in her final hours. Before that same man, Darren Walker, went on to sexually assault the nine-year-old and then strangle her. He finished by taking his own life. Today, Stacey's mother, Roxanne, arrived at the inquest into her daughter's death. In a statement read out by the coroner, she described how Stacey had been out with Darren in his lorry several times beforehand, how she really enjoyed the trips away from home, how Darren had been a laid-back person. It was on the Friday before the August bank holiday that Stacey set off with Walker for their delivery trip. On their way back, they stopped at this service station on the outskirts of Peterborough, CCTV pictures show the couple buying food. No one who saw them that afternoon could possibly have predicted what was about to happen. The pair had left the West Midlands for Great Yarmouth in the early hours of the morning before making deliveries across Norfolk. After their food stop at 3pm, the lorry arrived 35 minutes later in the lay-by off the A605 in Warmington. At 7pm, another driver spotted Walker and Stacey outside the lorry. He said there was nothing to arouse suspicion. Later, during a phone call home, Stacey's mum heard her talking and watching TV in the background. 
When Stacy's body was found the next day, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a rope. It was cut from the same piece of rope that Darren Walker used to hang himself from a nearby tree. Speaking last September, Roxanne Lawrence described how she felt towards Darren Walker. I hate him for what he's done to her. Friday morning, I loved him. No, no, I was hating for what he's done. But the man that I loved is not the man that did this. Like, you know, this isn't. This isn't the man we knew who did this. But obviously, the man that did this is an animal. Recording a verdict of unlawful killing, the coroner spoke to Stacey's family and said, I make no criticism of you. You could not have contemplated that such a tragedy could befall Stacey. But she added, sleeping in a lorry cab is no appropriate place for a nine-year-old girl, who, in my view, should be safely tucked up in her bed at home. A home.